you know, I can't get to Val d'Isere skiing this week, but I can jump into the metaverse and have a morning of it and then still be in the office in London on, you know, in the afternoon. What happens when it starts becoming better than real life? The, the thought of me having completed a whole bunch of tasks, including work before most people have got up is great. And it means that by midday, I've completed most of the things that I need to do. And then I can actually kick my feet up and take the, the dog out yeah. for a walk and all that kind of stuff. And I just came out and it was almost like you could, you know, you could smell these, you know, I could smell individual plants and trees. It was in Devon, so it was beautiful. And it was in the middle of summer. Um, the wind, the warm wind on my face, just wow. the, everything being in like glorious technicolor. Yeah. Um, you know, like as if someone had got it on Snapseed and turned the saturation up. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Oh, yeah, we, we got um, a, a pup. Uh, oh, you when, got a pup as well? We, we got a pup when Anna was uh, probably like six months pregnant. Mm. So we did the whole drive up to yeah, maybe maybe like three months or something like that. And um, yeah. Which which was fine, but uh, he had so I dealt with him. A lab is a lab pup, and he's basically full of beans. But he, I was sort of dealing with him through the whole of lockdown and trying to train him and yeah, just yeah. Bas basically get get him to be like a grown up adult dog, which didn't work. Um, yeah. So now, is, <laughs> so now now we have the juggle in the morning as I'm going out to train Hector and uh, who's a dog and. And uh, and then Anna's with Atlas, so get it all done at once. That's what I say, and then they'll be they'll be good mates. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, I, I want to know, like, how is juggling a baby uh, I, I, versus all the other like incredible feats that you've done thus far? Like, it's it it, it, it you like you said, it's different, right? Yeah, it, as you can tell by my bags, um, <laughs> it, it's it's different. You know, I'm. 43 now so i've i've led a, a life that's really fairly selfish and and um i say selfish you know but i mean doing what i wanted when i wanted wife was the same and um and i guess it was kind of locked down we we sort of you know we, we we started discussing the merits of you know having a kid and you know it it wasn't like let's just have a kid you know there was there was a lot went into it because Anna works in television you know it would have been her career for the you know for however long you know she takes off work that that takes a hit and then also I guess it's do you want to bring a kid into the world when it's this this bad yeah, and, yeah. and weird and messed up um and uh, you know what what's his life going to be like but so so we probably weighed it up a lot more but um I would say it's like it's awesome. It's you know, my my life has been doing hard things in hard places, um, and you know I'm I'm still doing that. I've I've never really taken huge risks with that, but um, I think you know the more I see him develop, the more mm. I'm I'm sort of like falling in love with the little dude, um, yeah. which is yeah. which is you know it's it's just never been on my my radar. Um, you know I I miss the birth. Um, which was yeah. this this year, uh, I was I was out filming in um, uh, Dominican Republic, and you know just the way that everything fell with COVID and with filming schedules and everything sort of got moved left and right. Um, that that was kind of you know, I, and to be thankful, that was really on, the only sort of big issue that that Anna and I had with COVID was the fact that my dates all changed and, and I missed mm. the birth you know so it, it could have been a whole lot worse I'm sure yeah 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 I well I've had you um I've had you in my ears the whole week right and, <laughs> it, and, it, and throughout the week it, it kind of feels like I'm listening to like 10 different books in one because you've had <laughs> so many life experiences so many different you know, parts of the world that you've worked in, you know, different elements of your life and stuff. And um, the one thing that kind of struck me is um, you're, you've been able to like uh, curate this incredible life that by your own admission so that is quite selfish because you, you can just do things around the world and stuff. And obviously your, your priorities are changing now. But the one thing that, that made me um, 
what it made me think about was this uh, this quote from Naval Ravikant. I'm not too sure if you're aware of him. He's a no. he's a tech billionaire in um, Silicon Valley. He's uh, the founder of AngelList, and he's written this book, uh, which is all about the guide to work and happiness. So it's it's geared towards people like in the tech industry and and, and people you know who work in office jobs. But he he, f- there's this one thing. It's like find work that feels like play, and it, and listening to your your experiences it just sounds like you've nailed it it sounds like you found like the perfect balance that makes other people see what you do think like oh my god i can never do that but for you it's like the most incredible way to live your life and it feels like you just wake up every single day and you're like i'm smashing life is that is that fair Uh, to say yeah my my wife wouldn't agree with that sometimes she thinks (laughs) i'm a grumpy old git but um you 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 mentioned it sort of when you you know when you first um started there was curated and you know if it's hard to say this without sounding arrogant so that's not the way that I'm trying to come across but what I'm trying to say is is that um it's it's been planned I have planned it that way I uh discovered very early on that that life is incredibly fragile and brief you know even if we live to a hundred years it's it's just such a flash in the pan a speck of of you know it's it's almost like it doesn't matter but yet for us you know that's such a long period of time inverted commas and um i think i sort of found out early on um that that you know life was incredibly short but it there was there was hacks to it um and and the hacks were first of all the biggest life hack that you know that i can probably try and communicate is the fact that you you can literally be do have whatever you want now that sounds ridiculous but most people you know in my experience of talking to them talking to them don't really know what it is that they want you know we're so busy and maybe you do for a bit when you're at university because you have to choose what you want to go and study and then you come out and then there's all of this decision again and all of these things to do. So I feel lucky that early on I, I found that passion. You know, that passion for me was was adventure, mm. being outside um, and, you know, working with other like-minded people and testing myself physically, mentally and emotionally. And, and I think since I found that and discovered that everything that I've been doing has been with purpose um and and short periods of my life and time that i haven't had purpose has been the times that i've been the most sad and the most lost um and so so for me personally that that purpose gives me the drive that pushes me to do all of these things that i do and maybe that's the biggest thing you know if if the why isn't big enough then then it's very hard to to get out of bed and smash the day yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've had that drive from quite an an early part of your you, you know your life. Like, I mean, maybe we could talk a bit about your upbringing because it's it sounds to me that you had like real ambition as a kid. Like, you saw that marine who came into the the cafe, and you're like, that's exactly what I want to do. Like, and and that's you had that focus. Like, what what what? How, what did that come from your your parents or certain elements of your of your early life? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Looking back, you know my. I, I kind of just always thought that it's normal and feel like it's normal. And, I, you know, I joined the Marines at 16 um, and, and was then in, in a unit of, um, let's say, a thousand men who are all high achievers by default. So I found that, you know, it, it was kind of easy. It was the norm to be mm. an overachiever, it, you know, in, in certain respects. It was the norm to, to just be continually pushing and driving. Um so I don't know. I'm not entirely sure whether that's nature or nurture on that fact. Mm. You know, maybe maybe the seeds were there from just the upbringing that I had, being outside, being in the scouts. Kind of. I don't know that. That I kind of realised early on that everyone, you know, is just muddling through life. You know, you my you know my parents. I remember them sort of losing the plot at me and shouting, and and me thinking, that's bizarre. You know, I've just made them lose their temper and they're shouting at me it doesn't affect me i literally couldn't care if they screamed at my face or or hit me which they didn't but you know like i didn't care because i knew it was a process so i think you know it was maybe 
I don't know if that's a sort of enlightened way of thinking or, or a stupid way of thinking, but it, it just kind of made everything very clear to me that if you want something, first of all, you have to know what it is that you want, and then you just work out what the steps are to get there. And and, and at that point, I suppose everything became crystal clear that, you know, there was no, there's no black magic, there's no sort of witchcraft in, in any of it. It was just process and graft, you know, you know what it is that you want to do, and then you work to get it. Um, and, you know, and if you don't work hard enough to get that thing, then you obviously don't want it enough. It's not that mm. important to you. So um, I would say, yeah, a bit of nature and uh, nurture. Yeah. And you, I mean, you give like talks to kids and you've had interactions with people, uh, you know, at, at various transitions of their, their early life. A lot of people that I come across are, are confused about what they want. So... If somebody was to ask you, maybe then they're a teens, you know, how do you get clarity? How, how do you wade through the confusion of what, what you really want to do? And, and instead of getting pulled into what other people are doing, what kind of advice do you yeah. give them? Um, it, it's, it's difficult now, you know, for me to, you know, when I go into school, people want to be into schools, people want to be influencers, they want to be social media um, sort of gurus, or they want to be a YouTube um, influencer. And, but, but when you dig down into it and say, well, what are you going to, what value are you going to add? You know, that they don't really know what they want to influence people about. So, mm. you know, that, that is the clearest example is how can you have a massive following if you've got nothing to say? You know, if you've got nothing good to say about the subject. So what I tend to say to people at that point is work out what it is that interests you um, or that you value, or that is a big part of your life, and then become an expert in that thing, and everything else will follow. You know, when you find your passion, it's almost a cliche because it's it's been said for a millennium. But people, you know, more often than not, get caught up in the everyday life of before you know it, you're sort of strung down by a mortgage and kids in the house, and you haven't done all the things that you said you were going to do. When you know, really, it it's it's about understanding what it is that motivates you as a person is it money that motivates you is it helping other people um and so for me personally i feel like adding value to someone else's life is helpful and that's what pushes me and i've never looked for fame i've never looked for riches in fact when i was chasing that in early days of, in sort of like business and work I, like i was a unhappy and b unsuccessful you know i, I didn't make any money doing it and I, I switch into what I'm passionate about. And, you know, before you know it, there's there's opportunity everywhere. It's sort of like the blinkers are off and, and you can see these opportunities. But I would say, you know, in a nutshell, people, if they are lost, you know, need to find the thing that they think interests them. And the funny thing that becomes apparent over years is that no matter how much you think money is important and a good motivator, from the positive it, it generally isn't you know and you know you only need to speak to bankers or people that are making lots and lots of money uh, more than you could imagine was feasible and and they're not happy with their life um or their lot so i think it it goes back to a lot of a lot of the basics of what makes you as a person happy and then we've got to remember that we live in an exponential age where you know, we've, you know, the kids that are coming out of school now are having so much choice, mm. so much, you know, you can earn your money by doing a normal job or you could earn your money by doing something where you don't even need to leave your house or pajamas and you can make more money than I've ever made or more money than my dad has ever made doing his job. Um, you know, and so there is so much choice now. Um, but I guess it comes back down to what's important to you what motivates you um, and I always think you know if you go out to do something to add value to the community that you're in or to the country or to the world by default you become successful I'm, I'm not... really interested in your opinion on this right because you know you're someone who's been to all corners of the world you've rode across the ocean you know you, you've gone through marine training sniper training 
And we're moving towards a meta world, right? So Facebook is rebranding to meta, for example. A lot more of us are spending more time on our screens. We were essentially cyborgs, as like Elon Musk has said, because we always have a phone next to us and we have access to the information. And it's going to be a very small amount of time before we're actually going to have devices inside us as well. And we're going to be spending less proportion of our time in real life having those genuine experiences. What do you think, now that you have a child, okay, what, what do you think about the next 10, 20 years and how do you feel, if you do feel that you need to protect them from the downside of, of excess connectivity? I think it's, I mean, this is super interesting and it's something I don't get to talk about or think in depth enough about because when I speak to people on a podcast, they want to know about abseiling into a volcano or, yeah. you know, like, yeah. I don't know, being chased by a rhino or something. But, yeah. you know, what what is interesting is, you know, you travel to 100 odd countries, you see, you know, let's say I'm in the Amazon or I'm in Suriname and I'm paddling down a river, it, you know, that no one's ever paddled down before and there's a, a big blossom tree that's just come into blossom and the flowers are falling down spiraling down the seeds into the river you know like that is something that is incredibly difficult to recreate mm. you know being there but having said that you know the age that we live in now you said about facebook talking about the metaverse we already live in a connected digital world where you and i are in the pub you know imagine 15 years ago 20 years ago you asked me a question how far is it across atlantic i'm like no idea now I can go, well, it's this far, you know, yeah. I could go to the toilet and be sneaky and, and pull it up and then come <laughs> back. And, you know, like we have, we have all of this information at our hands and at our fingertips. And I think, you know, potentially it's incredibly, incredibly exciting times, you know, and we live in the metaverse anyway, you know, my phone, I can jump into several different worlds in a second, you know, I can mm. email, I can be in Instagram. And I think, when people talk about the, the sort of interconnectedness of the metaverse, it's, it's just the, you know, it's web three, it's the interconnectedness, the internet of things, everything is, is just seamlessly linked, you know, and, and it's the same now, you know, I jump in my car, I've got um, an electric fold, jump in the car, I don't connect my phone, I don't have to go through all this stuff to make sure it's talking. And, you know, my phone, the last tune that I was listening to comes up, it knows where my home is, it, you know, it knows how I drive. And, you know, thinking, you know, I was, I was thinking, uh, we were away camping a couple of weeks ago and Atlas was sat, this was in my van and he's sat in the front and he's like playing with a gear stick and he's, and I was thinking he'll, he'll probably never be taught to drive. Yeah. And yeah. he'll not need to learn to drive because at some point, very soon, mm. there will be, there will be, is it stage five autonomous vehicles? Uh, either way, you know, yeah. he'll call a car, a car will come with no one in it, it'll pick him up and it will take him somewhere else. And that'll be it. You know, he, yeah. he won't need to drive. And, you know, in, in, in a way you think, a lot of people that I speak to in my line of work think, you know, it's shit, you know, it's really bad, it's wrong. You know, everyone's going to, you know, turn into lazy couch potatoes. Yeah. But I wonder, I wonder, you know, does getting rid of all the things that, that we need to do now, um, does that give us more time to enjoy real environments to mm. get outside? I'm, I'm not sure. And maybe, maybe it's just everyone becomes a better or worse version of themselves already. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and maybe the other side is, you know, I can't get to Val d'Isere skiing this week. But I can jump into the metaverse and have a morning of it and then still be in the office in London on, you know, in the afternoon. I don't know what happens when it starts becoming better than real life. That's probably... That's that's the the scary bit, I think, if it becomes better than real life. Because right now, I, I guess, you know, there is a degree of separation. Like the fact that we're having a conversation through some pretty good high definition screens is, is great but it can't compare to if you were right in front of me and we were like chatting over coffee or a pint or whatever, um, you know, it, but when it becomes as good or better, that's where it's like, oh, okay, that that's where it becomes it's, a bit scary. It's, I mean, it's already happening. So there is technology now that we can zoom, but we can be in the same room and it's, 
you know, it's in early stages, but it's almost as good as being in the room with you. You know, I can mm. see around you in three dimension. You can see me. And then, you know, and, and maybe, you know, maybe the pandemic already showed that is that people either don't want to or don't have to be in city hubs. Um, you know, we can we can move out to the country and, you know, maybe we get a surf in in the morning. Then we're in the meeting in London. It's not time travel, but it's as good as you're going to get. You know, yeah. you, you can be surfing in the morning and actually sat in what feels like a real office in London, New York, somewhere else by the afternoon. And then you can be back out walking the dog along the beach, you know, that night. I, maybe it's just got to do with how people already see life now and what they make use of in their life already. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a, an internal optimist about this kind of stuff, right? So I see the positives. So, yeah, I think you even mentioned it in your book where uh, you've become more of a... Con- conservationist uh throughout your travels because you want to protect everything you've seen and you you, you live in a, a bit of um you know you, you've got do- two opinions about uh, talking about the stuff in a book uh versus encouraging people to go out and jump on planes and go and see it for themselves yeah because you want to you know try and so if we could have experiences where you're the one jumping down a volcano you're the one like swimming down the amazon river and i can experience that and then still have a rich experience of going for a walk through hills close to home in the uk and having that you know connection with nature then that's kind of like the best of both worlds and, yeah. and also from a from a living perspective you know it means that i don't have to be cooped up in the middle of london breathing all the uh the uh, polluted uh, air i could live further outside and still attend meetings or still you know practice medicine remotely yeah exactly and uh, you know uh, yeah I, I think i'm the same in in a way it's it's you know I, whether it's positive or negative you you kind of uh, as a human we can't change the path of that adventurous path of you know exponential growth and continually um exploring you know we you know we did it with countries and then we're doing it with space and then we're doing it with planets um yeah i yeah it's, it's interesting i haven't fully got my my head around it yet i feel positive in that respect um and you know it seems like you know we sort of came from you know a hunter gatherer age and then we you know we then work out how to grow um and farm crops and animals um Mm. sort of agricultural then we went into industrial and it seems like the next stage that we're pushing into is you know information and you know i guess being being a fully connected sort of world and uh, yeah i you know going back to your question with atlas i'm excited but i you know i'm also i would like to instill in him that he can still get out and see these places but you know like you say with you know with encouraging people to travel is is going against you know this sort of what's happening with the planet air travel um and, and yeah all of these things that end up being digitized and in the metaverse and in these worlds have to someone still has to have that in their head like is it pixar with up you know yeah. you, you see them on top of angel falls you know and it it looks like what it was like up there and that you know there had to be people to go and see that and to have it in their head and then to to film it yeah yeah that's it that's super exciting i I think you know we're in a unique situation where we can we we haven't grown up with uh with devices throughout our i mean you're six about six years older than me so when i went to school i didn't get my first mobile phone until i was like 14 or 15 you yeah. didn't have mobile phones throughout your your schooling so you've developed uh, almost like the in real life skills to be able to deal with technology in an appropriate way whereas i think right now we're, what we're seeing with, with children is you know they, they've ha- they've always had screens in front of them and I, and I think one of the things that, that spoke to me in your book is you have this unique ability to visualize and picture yourself and almost compartmentalize as well. And, it, and, and I wonder if that was through your marine training, because I think that will serve people in the future when we have to deal with multiple um, devices that are grabbing our attention. Um, and is, is that something that you, you developed during your, your training yeah. or is that something you've always had? compartmentalizing a situation and, and dealing with you know being being calm in chaos finding comfort in chaos is is you know it's, it's not taught in a lesson in the marines per se they don't mm. say we're going to teach you uh 
you know, comfort and chaos today. It's, you know, it's not that. But what they do is they train you so much, you know, train hard, fight easy. They train you so much that when a situation unfolds, wherever it is in the world, you're not only ready, but you're ready for the curveball. And I think that's, you know, that's what that compartmentalizing does is that um, it allows you breathing space. You know, when when the proverbial does hit the fan, it's, you know, it, a lot of people just get bogged down into, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people in any situation that, that might not even be life-threatening will be straight into a, a sort of denial phase and then deliberate, what do we do now? Uh, don't do anything. Stumble around, not make decisions, mm. and then eventually get to decision-making. Whereas, you know, in, in the Marines, in the military, and certainly in the expedition life that I lead, you can, you can, another life hack is, you know, you just make a decision straight away, you know, think about all of the options you've got, make a decision. And, and by doing that, you're compartmentalizing that situation um, and, and you're dealing with it. So even if that is out of your controls, let's say a situation that you get thrown into, bang, Tuesday morning, there you go, you're in this situation. You didn't choose it, it's not of your doing, but you do have the option as to A, how you act and B, how you think. Um, and, you know, the, the denial phase in a trauma situation or the denial phase in a, um, a situation that's, I don't know, that could be happening on the tube, for example, or deliberating, all of this is just using up valuable time. Mm. And so, so for me, it's much more about, in, in, and this is true in any life situation, um, it doesn't need to be extreme, is to just gather the facts deal with facts, try and remove, it's an important part, emotion, but try and understand where that's coming from, then remove it, deal with facts, often write it down and then make a decision. And and more often than not, I find, bear in mind I'm not a psychologist, but I find that is directly transferable from, you know, having to come up with a, a quick fix in the jungle to a situation that could potentially unravel and, and someone ends up dead. Mm. You know, that's, you know, the, the same process is available in everyday life to everyone about things that are keeping them awake at night, financial issues, family issues, relationships. And a lot of it, I think you find is that you end up being hemmed in by your own imagination or by, you, you know, even worse than your own opinion is someone else's opinion. Um, mm. So, yeah, that compartmentalizing a situation and dealing with the facts in that situation um, and then making a decision is, is quite, it's a liberating process and it, you know, it allows you to move on regardless of whether that decision was right or wrong. If it was the wrong decision, it opens other doors and other opportunities. Um, but I always feel that gives you control of that situation that, that you're in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll be honest, in the spirit of vulnerability, I really struggle with this. And I'm someone who has meditated most of their life, right? So I was taught how to meditate when I was a teenager before my GCSEs. My, my par I come from an Indian background, so my parents taught me that. I meditate before I go to clinic and stuff. I do meditations in the morning. During my 10 minutes of meditation every day, which is kind of a formalized process, I'm not too sure if you do something as formal as that, but I get tons of thoughts in my head. I struggle really hard to, to really uh, focus my thoughts on even just deep breathing. And there's there's a bit of the, the start of the book as well as later on in the book where you're in the middle of your um, uh, sniper recce, I think, in Iraq, and you go into what sounds and, and is described like a flow state. Is yeah. that something you can can still do now? Is that something that is, is, is some, so, something that you formally practice or something that just comes quite naturally to you? Um, I would say that it's, it's not natural. Um, I've never... You know, I've, I've, as much as I love to, the thought of sitting with the sun rising and, and just being like in a state of Zen and, you know, <laughs> like doing yoga and breathing and, you know, it's, it's never been formal like that for me as much as I would love that to be, you know, I've just never been taught. Mm. But for me, the sniping part of my early life, it wasn't ever about pulling a trigger or, or doing anything violent which is strange it was much more about being able to connect with the environment that i'm in um, and it sounds really cheese ball but being at one in that environment understanding that i can move from a to b 
and be completely self-sufficient and no one will see me, jungle, desert, arctic, mountains, wherever that is, that supreme confidence of being able to to move and operate in mm. those situations. And by default, one, the confidence, and two, the ability or the necessity to control fear. You know, we don't, we don't not feel it, but the ability to control fear, internal voices, nagging voices in your head, all of these things that we all suffer from, it's, it's just a much, um, you know, the, the shooting part of, like if you're on the range and you're doing shooting practice, you kind of, you've got two or three things which are incredibly important right at that very space in time in your life to make that shot hit the target, the bullseye. Um, everything else is noise. So it's, it's f- focus. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at multitasking. I can do five or six things at once and not all of them will be done very well. Um, but when you focus on one specific task, it's, it is amazing what you can achieve just by focusing on one thing or two things and doing them to the best of your ability. And I suppose that is, you know, that is a state of flow when you can, you know, when you're breathing and, and actually if you, I think if you bring, break, um, all states of meditation and, and states of flow back to the basics, it's breath work Mm. and, and, you know, I don't formally practice it, but because I, free dive and because you know by free diving by definition you need to a remain calm and and b you know you're you're under the water there's physiological changes happening to your body you become in a very natural state of of chill but i also get the same from running and i get the same from exercising so if you know if i'm being a pain in the backside my wife will tell me to go for a run (laughs) or like yesterday i I had um a sort of big big corporate talk to do last night and I just the whole morning just couldn't concentrate on anything so I just did a very long run and in the run I had broken everything down that I needed to be doing in the evening into these chunks it all just becomes clear and that is that state of flow is that state of focus for me and that's probably my my meditation yeah, definitely. Because I think most people's idea of sniper training is quite different from your description of it. I'm, I'll be honest, my idea of sniper training was like all about the gear and the gadgets yeah. and, you know, the sight, the scope and all that kind of stuff. But your description of it made so much sense. Um, yeah. C- can you give us a window into to how, yeah. how you, uh, a sniper would operate? I mean, if you speak to any kid or up to up to the age of probably 25 like they're going to know more about sniper rifles technology than than me because they play call of duty right (laughs) (laughs) so so i remember i I did a talk at manchester united um a while ago and you know that was that was the hook that got them interested in listening to me talking was the fact that you know they played call of duty and i was a sniper um but yeah you know you you can spend a lot of time digging into the tech and ballistics and the weapons and the sight systems, but all of that doesn't matter if you one can't move from A to B, you know, on your own, unsupported, without being seen when people are looking for you. No, that is, you know, fundamental basics, camouflage and concealment. That is the basics of understanding the environment that you're moving through to the you know, to the absolute micro detail of when I'm looking at that branch, you know, the top side of, of leaves are usually shiny and the underside are dull and, and I can see dull and it's on the top. So I'm, you know, it's it's about seeing and understanding the environment, talking about ground sign, all of these basics, you know, why have the buds stopped? Most people in lockdown became aware of bud chorus. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But but because you know, I it's it's a, a primary cursor to my day starting in the jungle is chorus or my day ending in the jungle is the um the evening chorus. Um, you know, I'm very aware of these things and, and you know, they're always there. These signs, these cues are always there, but it's about reading them. So so for me, being a sniper was much more about the the mental state. So one, I need to be reliant on myself. I need 
supreme confidence in my abilities, but without the ego, because the ego will get you killed. Mm. Um, I need to understand um, each and every single environment and the nuances of that environment. Um, and so it was much more about that than, you know, the, the tech. A- anyone, really, it could be argued, could be taught on a range with a very high powered rifle and all the right bits of kit could be taught how to shoot and get, you know, the bullet onto the target. Most people, not the same majority of people could be taught over a week or two weeks how to actually stock, to map read, to, to understand air photography, you know, so like all of the other bits and pieces. Um, so it was much, it was much more about that to me than, than, you know, the, than the tech. Um, yeah, I guess there's a parallel with uh, marine training in general, right? Because I think most people will look at the hard feats, like the the marching, the climbing, the early starts, and all that kind of stuff. But it's it 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 sounds like it's a lot more about the mental toughness as much as it is the physical toughness, which is why it's so hard to complete that training. And it almost sounds like it's a physical manifestation of training in stoicism. And you, you mentioned you, you, you started reading a lot about Stoics. Um, did that help you through that, that process? I think, you know, the reading that I have done of, of Stoics and Stoicism has been more of a, ah, that's what I am. That's how I am. Mm. Um, it, it hasn't, like, I haven't read it and used it as a textbook to say, right, I need to practice this more. You know, I've got shelves of books up there that I have read of things like meditation. I think I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. But with the, um, you know, stoicism, it, it, it was more like, a, ah, that's, I understand that because that's the way I am. Mm. Um, and I don't know whether being a soldier makes you like that or not. Um, but I find that that I use a mix of it. You know, I'm I'm not far from a military machine of, you know, physically fit, you know, unbreakable, um, and, and 110% dialed mentally resilient, you know, that's, that's not the case. And actually it's not the case for, for almost everyone that I know that, that have been elite or special forces. Um, it's very opposite to what someone who sat at home playing Call of Duty thinks a soldier is, you know, Mm. there's, there's a, a big sort of paradox there, I guess. Um, but yeah, you know that that I guess it is stoicism. But in you know, there's a lot of buzzwords that get thrown around now, like resilience and mental fitness, and all of these things are are you know they're all practicable if you yeah. understand a the benefits of them, and you know, and also to understand what the opposite number of that is as well, because you know by building the walls to keep the world out does exactly that you know it keeps good and bad out um so so it's everything's a, a balancing act i think yeah i think a lot of people came to stoicism over the last couple of years because of the scenarios that we found ourselves in so where we couldn't change our external uh environment but we could change our internal state um and i mean I, i've been reading stoics uh, for the last few years and meditations is one of my favorite books i kind of listen to it every now and then just like 20 minutes and i like and i have that same sort of uh, thought process of like ah that's that's uh what how i should uh process this information or how i should process this uh situation i find myself in um whereas I guess one pushback is a lot of people might find it quite hard to practice. It's like, oh, it's good for you because you've had that experience. So how do you bring that relation to people, perhaps, you know, who you're doing a corporate talk with or, or kids in schools? Like, how do you how do you make it a lot more relatable to them? Yes, yeah, I, uh, I suppose that, that, you know, it's a huge subject. But an example might be if you ask someone, you know, when you know have you ever had road rage screamed at someone lost a temper um which you know most people have at some point or something's happened you know and you, and you got really angry and you lost your temper and then you look back on it a week later a year later and you, you're just mortified that that you've done that that is an example of you know being able to in the moment think in the future i'm going to i'm going to hate the fact that i've you know done this so mm. just breathe and actually we go back to breathing everything can be sorted by breathing and and distance you know time time is probably 
probably the biggest thing you know that there is the i mean there's been some fairly horrendous things done on planet earth and over the very short space of time one generation two generations it, it's almost forgotten so so if we can if that can happen around the world with with horrendous big things you know we can in our everyday life we can take take a step we can pause we can give it a bit of time and space um and then and then not react but still you know stoicism is, is one of those things as well that it doesn't help again use my wife as an example it doesn't help to be stony cold and and say well this doesn't affect me because i'm stoic um yeah you know it and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure back in the day, 2000 years ago, Marcus Aurelius would have been affected and lost his temper by certain things. And absolutely. Um, and so it, it's I think it's a, a balance. Um, and, you know, it's about I think it's probably about teaching. If I was trying to explain it to kids would be about effectively you have control over your thoughts and your actions. You know, you can't say that someone forced you to do something really um and to take ownership of it yeah i and i think you know we run the risk of sounding puritanical on this so i'm glad that you know you're uh you talk about how your wife still uh thinks you get <laughs> sometimes and tells you to go on a run because you know it's it's always like a work in progress like i i was i still have uh discussions with my partner where she's like no you just you know i you just need to hear me I feel angry rather than try and provide a solution the whole time or try and tell me that I should be thinking in this way. And like, I get it. Sometimes you just need to like catch yourself. I'm like, okay, we're not, yeah. you know, machines here. We are humans with emotions and it's all a work in progress. My, my wife would definitely agree with that. Um, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's helpful. It's helpful to a point, but then sometimes, you know, showing your emotion and vulnerability and, you know, actually more often than not, like yesterday, you know, I, worried about doing a talk you know it comes across in the way that i am and what i'm doing and what i'm saying and and you know that's exactly and i would be the first person that says go for a run go and clear your head do something um yeah know. and i guess like you know particularly for someone like yourself um people see the trophies of experiences that you've you've had right up to this point they just see the highlight reel but they don't really understand the graft the the constant um uh, pushing you know the chicken dance that you had to do when you were an energy sales people no one sees that you know yeah. uh, as, a, as a foundation to everything that you're pushing yourself to do now right yeah it's i mean it's social media you know we we all get a glimpse into this you know this world and you put up the best bits and it's edited and you know even even writing a book really is is edited um you know to to a certain point you're getting the story out there mm. um from your point of view and it's you know if someone else was to write the book about you who knew you well would it be the same would it be different i don't know but um yeah it's you know it, it's taken a long time to get to where i am now and i certainly would never say that you know i'm at the peak of what I'm doing because I feel like if you're at that point then you're on the way down um mm. so so for me you know fundamentally my job now is is looking after television and film crews in extreme remote hostile places from a technical level so I can get a film crew into the canopy of the jungle to film um a sort of uh, a primate sequence or I can um or I can uh, get a film crew into a war zone or into, um, I don't know, sort of like narco territory and, and to do interviews there. Um, or, you know, it can be environmental mountains or it can be chasing down drug traffickers or, or tiger traffickers in an investigation. So, so really, you know, what, what I'm doing is, is the, I wouldn't say culmination, but it's like, it's years of all of these different experiences and, what I'm doing now is different to four years ago, different to eight years ago and different to four years in the future. But for me personally, I've always just flexed. And when this when this stops or if it stops for whatever reason, then I, then I'll just, you know, I'll just bail into another direction and find something else within my bounds of the passion that, that drives me. I, I will look for another opportunity, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it definitely does. And, it, you know, if someone who's who's read the book and, and listened to it as well, 
uh, it definitely makes sense because it, it feels that you've built on your experiences on this foundation that has kept you grounded. Um, yeah. On, on the subject of things that keep you grounded, actually, apart from your wife, it sounds like hoovering does as well. What? <laughs> tell me a bit about the hoovering obsession. <laughs> I, I, do, I mean, like the, the, the old adage in the Marines is, is join the Marines, clean the world. And, you know, you... you <laughs> You know, you, you, you would go somewhere to do an exercise or something in the accommodation you would move into. The first thing you would do is clean it. So I would say not every Marine is the same as me, but I would venture to suggest that the majority of them are, are quite OCD only clean. Um, so, but I don't know. It's just like, you know, when I, let's say I was over in Colombia doing narco work with um, Foxy and you know, I come back, you know, like the first thing I do is, top to toe of the house you know i like hoover you know and that you know that is grounded like i don't have cleaners doing all my stuff like one because i know that they're not going to do as good a job as me um yeah. and, and two that's what i do to decompress you know i come back and and you know and it's it's just a whirlwind for two days of me decompressing and doing all the things where i'm like i'm gonna clean the house i'm gonna hoover i'm gonna do that and and actually what that is 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 me decompressing from the mm. trip you know it's it's you know it's it's probably very classical if if a psychologist was to look at it of coming back from an intense situation to normality and and also a way of sort of tempering you know i don't you know you, let's say you're you're living in the jungle sort of in a hammock and you're traveling every day and it's it's easy like that is easy and then you then come back to everyday life where, you know, you have the big shop and, you know, you've got to like, where am I filling up the car? We're going to see this person next week. You know, like all the normal life stuff is, is hard. Mm. And I get to see that when I'm, when I'm away, because when you're on expedition, you have like basics, food, water, shelter, like old school, old school, what, what humans really just had to worry about. Um, and then maybe security protection, you know, if you're, you know, from dinosaurs or from whatever animals. Yeah, from narcos. Yeah, or narcos, yeah. Um, so so that's, like, really easy. Some people will think that that's hard, you know, you're yeah. on an expedition and it's... But actually, it's as easy as life gets because you have only got to eat, drink, and sleep. Like, you know, you're doing lots of hard things, but... You know, that's the basics. Whereas you come back and in a way you can see why people are so bound by anxiety and fraught because everyday life is just hectic. Um, yeah. And anyway, so so when I come back from these trips, you know, then I, I go into my sort of couple of days of decompression, like doing the house. Anna now knows that it's not because she hasn't been tidying when I've been away. <laughs> she just She just knows it's what I do to get my head in order. That's such an interesting insight, honestly. I've had like a revelation there because the fact that you describe what most people's lives are as hard compared to the kind of stuff that you do when you're on shoots or, or traveling or doing ex expeditions as, you know, that's the easy side of things. Like that, that's completely different to how I yeah. would think about it. And most people, I guess. Well, that's, I mean, expeditions... So I wasn't saying that expeditions are easy, but no, 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 but of course not. <laughs> no, but 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 they but but they are. So let's say the expedition is hard, hard physically, right? As mm. a human being, hard physical graft is kind of what our heritage is up to a very recent point in time where we didn't need to run after things, we didn't need mm. to, um, you know, survival. We didn't, we didn't, you know. We, we are eternally comfortable you know when was the last time someone was so cold or so warm or so wet you know that they just had to ride it out for 12 hours and think well tomorrow the sun will come up so i'll be fine whereas you know our, our lives now are hectic you know they are utterly hectic and i get the fear like two or three days before coming back from a trip i get the fear because i'm like i've been off comms now for in fact i was just up in the Arctic Circle doing a, a job um, and we were diving under the ice sort of uh, on the sea ice um, and we were up there for two months and I had no comms, uh, no no comms at all, no WhatsApp, no social media, nothing and then 
in the last like two or three days when the ship's starting to move back down, you start getting sporadic bits of comms and you get your emails and that's when the that's when the sort of like anxiety starts to kick in again because you're like, Oh god, I've got to do that, I've got to do that. Then you're into everyday life of you know, one kid, I've only got one kid now and I'm just, you know, I'm like, how do people do it with three, four, five kids, yeah. football training, climbing club, weekend stuff, you know, family, friends, money worries, no job, you know, too many jobs. Yeah, It's just like, I mean, it's hectic. So wow. I have this like decompression after a trip and regardless of how hard it is physically, um, you know, I- I'm doing the basics of, food, water, shelter, hard graft. I then come back into this maelstrom of information, of hecticness where it's, yeah, this is funny. That is, yeah, that's so funny. I, would, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have thought about that. It, it sounds like you've got your, like, your routine of decompressing. I mean, what, I mean you, you mentioned at the start that Anna does a lot of the work, obviously, for, for uh, Atlas. Um, what, what are your coping mechanisms for regular life then? I didn't think I was going to ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you cope, given that you know, you've got to you know, go and see that person, do the shopping, all that kind of stuff? I think you... You know, I'm I'm not an expert at it by by far. And Anna will, <laughs> you know, and Anna will definitely say, you know, that I I can be a complete ass. Um, I I think it it's coping is is about again doing the things that matter, you know, like not getting mm. caught up in all the other bollocks that's going on because the, the majority of stuff actually is just noise. Like I don't I don't sit down at night and watch television, uh, you know, because it's it, I'm. I'm almost too busy up to the point where I'm kind of like shit is that the time it's like yeah. 11 o'clock and, I, and I'm going to bed and you know I've got 10% of what I had on my list to do f- for that day so um I, I think a coping mechanism is 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 just to get rid of the noise um, we we take actually both of us we take on a lot of things you know like we're active you know we're every weekend almost there's something on and we're doing yeah. something and we could say no to a lot of that, but that's the stuff that makes us us. It's going away, surfing for the weekend, or climbing, or up to Scotland. Uh, you know, like on the on a whim. You know, like the night before, we'll decide that we're going to go and climb Ben Nevis, or you know, from Bristol. Um, so, so that that can feel hectic, but also I would imagine getting to sixty and you know being caught up in just not making these decisions and not making these plans, you would still be as equally busy. They just wouldn't be your plans. In fact, it's like almost like if you don't have a plan, you'll become part of someone else's. That's, yeah. that's probably, probably what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, certainly for me having plans and, and structuring my day gives me uh, like hooks that I can like, okay. I, and again, it's a way in which I, um, focus and compartmentalize what I need to be focusing on at different periods. That certainly yeah. helped me. Um, and you know, it's funny you just mentioned that about like going up to Scotland on a whim. I went. Uh, the the closest thing I've had to any expedition of yours is uh, going to Edinburgh, a, a trip that was planned two months in advance, grabbing a camper van with my two best mates. And then we drove to like Isle of Skye and amazing. we had every luxury you can imagine. We had this amazing <laughs> camper van, had a kitchen in it and a shower. We stayed yeah. at a campsite. We already camped wild a couple of nights, I think. Yeah. Um, and that was that was tough enough for me. But I, I felt like the sense of like, I'm getting into nature here. And you're probably like rolling your eyes. Like, not, not, at all. <laughs> uh, not, not at all. Not at all. Because when I, you know, when, when I, I lived in London for four years and, I, like even the lifestyle that that I I was having a hectic life on expedition in a way a lot mm. and you know I I just loved coming back to London and not doing anything you know I was yeah. you know I was living in Tooting um and just you know and 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 if you were home for two or three months it was very easy to never leave um so I, I you know I I totally get that but um to go back to what you were saying about the the routine you know that that is important to me and. Um, so like I will always, even now with Atlas, if he's, you know, up at four or five, I will still always get into the gym, um, to the point where I just changed my garage into a gym because, you know, I know that training is important for me. Mm. Um, and if I don't get to train, then, then I'm going to struggle, um, with everything else in, 
in life so I made it much easier so I don't need to go to a gym so I've almost got no excuse to to train yeah. um and and by making that easier was means that I'm I'm you know I'm, I'm making it easier for me to do the things that I know make me function well so that routine like if I you know my, my day is busy and it'll be punctuated with a zoom or a meeting but I will always try and start it with uh with exercise yeah. um and then i will always try and end the day by taking the dog out like that's my you know they're my sort of two cues i know that's when you know i can have a beer then yeah. um, but that's 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 you know when my day's like that and i realized that when i went into the bunker uh which we you sort of mentioned earlier so yeah. I, I went into nuclear bunker for 10 days to do this experiment on circadian rhythm and and sleep but actually, what what I tried to do as soon as I went in there was because I felt it was so important was to draw a routine up, or, or, like scratch it into the walls, you know, my my ten days, and 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 then try and break them down as to what I would do each. Before we before we describe this experiment, can we just uh, r- remind listeners of why you did this in the first place? What what was the experiment trying to yeah. demonstrate? Sorry, it was um it was a BBC Horizon um experiment called body clock and it was it was really a sort of deep dive into i was just a guinea pig um yeah <laughs> but it was it was just a, a deep dive into sleep you know there i didn't realize this um you know because I, I train fairly hard during the day and i'm knackered by the time i go to bed so i sleep all the way through until atlas came um mm. And I, I didn't realize, you know, sleep was this the thing that that people really, really struggle with. And yeah. I know from from years of expedition work and being in the military that sleep deprivation is a killer. Mm. Um, not only shortening your your life really if you're doing it a lot, um, but you know it just makes decision making really bad, bad life choices, um, bad health choices. Like it, it's just not good for you. You know, I know that bit f- so much from from, but I thought that was you know it came with the territory of the job, and um anyway, it was a horizon experiment on uh, sleep deprivation, mm. um circadian rhythm, and they wanted to see that if if you put someone in the dark, um for ten days, what what happens to their sleep pattern, mm-hmm. um, and no reference to time, no technology, nothing. So it was supposed to be a cave. Um, which would be, I would have preferred that because it would have been harder. Um, but the, of course. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but the, 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 the cave had, um, the cave had radon gas or something in there. It would have been a disaster for me if I'd spent 10 oh, days God. in there. So we, 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 we moved it to, um, a nuclear bunker. So nuclear bunker, one story above the ground, three or four down underneath. Um, so I can, I get walked in there there's a there's soundproof booth room um down there that's enough to get a single bed in um i get walked down like say on monday morning um and then they sort of it's all rigged up in cameras and then then they the film crew head outside and lock the doors and that's it i'm in there for 10 days on my own so no laptops no phones no watch zero um you know, reference to time, and obviously you can't then see the daylight um, anywhere. Um, and so, at that point, I I kind of realised that I needed to have structure to my. I, I was going to say day, but you can't call it a day because you, mm. it it's a wake cycle or a sleep cycle, which is then what I called it. So I drew ten squares on the wall, and each one of those was going to be my day or my wake cycle, and then I'd sort of right in there like exercise and obviously i don't have time so it'd be like exercise for an hour so did you did you have like a torch or like a light when you were in there yeah yeah so the 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 room had like 10 watt bulbs in it or or, you know something so you you, very low yeah yeah. very low light but that was to allow the cameras to work so that obviously you could see it um so on, on the film it looks kind of like it's quite bright but you you know, you have to put a head torch on if you wanted to read something. Um, mm. So it's, and after a while, anyway, I found it very difficult to read because I, you know, like my mind was just unravelled in 
all over the place. So I, I, you know, I'd read the same paragraph over and over again. And I know, you know, people go on retreats where they don't talk, um, or, or you know, and, and they go on a retreat where, where they meditate for 10 days or longer. But from what I tell, there's, there's not a lot of people that go into solitary confinement um, you know, because he, if you're seeing other things, or let's say you're on a no talking retreat for 10 days, but you're outside in the environment, you know, I could, I could do that for indefinitely. Um, but when you're in, in, in a square box and there's no stimulations visually from your environment, it then becomes quite different. Um, and so I, you know, the, the thought process behind it, when they asked me if I would do it was that sure like i haven't i couldn't remember the last time that really i i'd I'd been completely off comms from everything and i was heading over to brazil to do a sort of illegal logging film um in the amazon there and and so so she was away and so i I wouldn't have had comms with her anyway and and i was like right fine you know we'll we'll do it um and yeah it, it was it was everything that I expected it to be and, and and also everything that I didn't expect it to be, just sort wow. of like mentally and emotionally and didn't realise that I was such a, a people person and needed, you know, I'm very, I've always been very good at operating on my own, you know, as a sniper, you know, with confidence in my own ability. I don't need other people to work with. For the last 15 years or so I've, I've been self-employed doing what I do so I spend a lot of time on my own at home mm. but but to be you know but I obviously interact with people as much as I can when I can and to have that taken away mm. um, was was very strange and this was all before lockdown so this was three years ago I did this right yeah yeah I mean what I mean what did you learn about mental fitness and mental nourishment from that experience because i mean it's it sounds like torture it is a form of torture i, f- I think um what what, what 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 kind of things have you done since that experiment um that that taught you uh everything so the um it is used solitary confinement um is is you know proven to cause um mental stress and, and long-lasting uh, mental illness um, mm. in prisoners. So, so most prisoners that have been in solitary confinement, I can't remember the stats, um, are, have have mental illness from it, because as a human, we, you know, we're almost programmed to. This is this is my take on it. We're programmed to interact with people. We always have been. We're social mm. social animals, um, but you know, I the main take out that I took away from it was one I can deal with it I knew I was getting out in 10 days I knew that I could deal with it and and I didn't unravel too much by the end of it so I was like you know I was happy with with that respect um but the big things that I took away from it were that I didn't I didn't have a a cue on because I'd always just done them was that without exercising properly daily without that routine the exercise formed the sort of cornerstones of without being outside and I, I don't mean just like sat in the room looking outside but I mean outside feeling the wind in my face you know smelling the air whatever that type of air is the, the stuff that I had been so used to over the years of being on expedition and being a sniper and always just being connected to the environment you know knowing noticing when the leaves are turning you know, noticing buds on, on, on trees after the winter that you know that you know we're just about to pop into spring, literally pop. Like noticing these things, you know, having that taken away, being outside, and interacting with people. So those three things: exercising, being outside, and interacting with people. It seemed like were the cornerstones of good mental health for me, mm. the foundational blocks of good mental health, and by taking one or all of those away um it it was it was amazing how how blue i started to feel and it made me then think you know how how many people are dealing with anxiety mental health issues that aren't necessarily giving themselves the best 
foundation of the best start to then build everything else on top of um and i guess it kind of you know fast forward a year and a half mm. um we we get thrown as a, as a, a world into a lockdown situation where people now no longer can have the life they used to have um you know they're not interacting with people in the same way they were they took maybe being outside for granted and, and exercising but then there's a lot of people who don't do any of those things you know I then started to think about you know my gran um who who died 10 12 years ago but she in the latter years of her life sat in a flat in glasgow didn't see anyone smoked 40 fags a day mm. um you know so so in a way also lonely also not exercising also not getting outside also not interacting with people mm. um and so i mean these these are probably very basic or a basic understanding of it and not being a psychologist you know it 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 you know, on a personal level, those are the things that seem to matter for my mental health. And just, you know, I dealt with it in a 10 day period because I, I had a flight that night to Greenland to do an expedition. So I, I, I knew I, did. <laughs> I, 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 I went from I went from 10 days in, in a nuclear bunker in the dark on my own to f- flying to Greenland on the on the last night for an expedition with Steve Backshaw into 24 hour daylight for the next five weeks oh, on this expedition. But um, yeah, I you know they, it seems like you know from a layman's point of view as a guinea pig that that if I didn't know that I was getting out on day ten, I I think I would have unravelled in half the time that that it would have taken me you know to to get that ten days maybe three or four days I I would have found it incredibly difficult and um yeah sorry I'm just rambling on about no it, no no that I mean that, that, I mean I could hear that story all over like <laughs> i've got so many questions uh about actually um but just on that note about how we can compare it in a less extreme way to lockdown um i think you know pragmatically speaking at the start of the pandemic it was certainly the right decision to lock down people yeah. because we didn't know what we were dealing with i remember vividly at the time i was having messages from friends in america and and family members my sister was in new york and i actually told her you need to come back to london because i need to have eyes on you i work at the local a e and itu so i know that you know i i can look after you because we had no idea about the um how spreadable this was uh, the lethality of it, the potential for um uh, viral changes um so at that time it was, it was super scary and i think it was the right thing to to lock down everyone thereafter once we've learned a lot more about the virus i don't think we've really appreciated the other impacts of locking down people and actually measuring that against the lethality of of said virus yeah and that's not to say that covid and the mutations aren't super scary and very very nasty conditions that have impacted you know friends and family as well as colleagues but we also have to marry everything else up uh, against it you know the financial insecurity the impact on anxiety the impact on eating disorders the the other intangibles that we don't really talk about enough and i think your experience kind of exemplifies just how important mental nourishment is from the perspective of being able to go outside or even just the the um the unknown of how long a lockdown is going to last for I, I think um, there's loads to talk about here on this, but you know, fear of the unknown is one of the biggest anxieties that that people have, and it's you know, it it's it, the old adage, knowledge dispels fear, um, and 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 it does, you know, monsters under the bed. If you actually got a torch and looked under there, there isn't a monster there, you know. So so that that knowledge um, that you know it dispelling fear and, and the fear of the unknown so we no one knew what it was that we we're dealing with um i a couple of years ago 2014 was in west africa through the the whole of the um ebola epidemic in in um liberia and sierra leone and i can tell you that was one of the most traumatic 
things that I've ever seen is, is to watch these nations being ripped apart by by a virus that, that you know, at the time had a mortality rate of high high 90s. Um, and it was a big decision to go down there and, and to to make this film with with the team. Um, and it was Unseen Enemy. And that film, at the very start, talks about it almost it, i mean if you if you get a chance to watch it it's, it's amazing cnn unseen enemy it, it describes a global pandemic breaking out that that isn't ebola but it's you know it effectively talks about what happens with you know when when covid sort of struck um and so it's inevitable it was inevitable um and and from what i understand there'll be plenty more of these these viruses and you know as soon as we open up a you know i've seen it firsthand you open up mm-hmm. um a logger will open up a route in the jungle to take down you know a big tree they they do it kind of almost surgically in some places where they just go for a specific tree but they'll open up a route and they'll take the tree they'll take that out that track is then open for local people going hunting um wildlife gets in there animals get in there dogs usually get in there then there's an interaction between the animals that live in the jungle and and those domesticated animals or people so you know i think at that time the cdc guy that i was speaking to in sierra leone was saying there'll be two or three of these viruses um that that transfer over into humans every single year and it's just Mm -hmm. a matter of time before one of them does exactly what virus is doing and spread well um and so my time in actually my time in west africa through the the whole of the ebola outbreak and the time in the bunker kind of gave me real perspective on when i was locked down in my flat in bristol and i had the internet and i had zoom and i had my garden to train in and i could be outside in my garden i was lucky enough to to have a garden we just moved actually from Tooting. Um, we didn't have a garden at there and we moved to Bristol and, and had a garden. So I kind of had this perspective of, I knew what it was like watching people die on the street and, and being watching, you know, 50 babies being buried on a day um, in Sierra Leone to this virus that, that we had here that to the majority of people didn't seem to, to affect. And you know, it was just a very, it's very difficult to, understand it still is you know it's still mm. difficult to understand i feel incredibly lucky because i work and have been able to work certainly in the last eight months a year um but i just wonder what the implications are to someone who let's say just finished university there are yeah. no jobs um at the minute around and we're, we're still in and out of lockdowns and and there's restrictions and i just think you know is is the mental health, you know, is it a mental health crisis that's that's about to to unfold in front of us? And is that a bigger implication? I I, I just always feel like I have to be careful because there's so many people being affected with it in yeah, so many yeah, different yeah. ways. But for the younger generation who aren't mainly affected by the virus, if they get it, um, but there are no jobs, there are no work. You know, they've they've had a lot of their um freedoms taken away festivals all the things that we used to take for granted you know those golden days are they gone are they gone forever um i don't know it's a, it's such a nuanced conversation it's very hard to to talk about because there aren't any um you know slogans uh that you can stand behind there's not just like open up or end lockdown you know it, and and unfortunately because most of the conversations we're having are on character limited social media platforms you don't yeah. really get to the the underbelly of what we need to be talking about the the, the nuance and 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 all these issues you know balancing uh the lethality of a of a virus the uh, impact on uh, mutations uh the impact on um uh, hospital pressures during winter yeah, yeah. you know with a, an immune naive uh, population there, there's so many issues and we've talked about it on this podcast actually from a number of different angles through immunology researchers people suffering with eating disorders etc uh, but it's really interesting to have your 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 perspective on that because as it's, it's almost like yeah 
you, you, the last uh, few years of experience up until the pandemic hitting was like gearing you up to be the perfect person to have this conversation. Someone who's experienced extreme isolation and an extreme virus. You well, know? that was, you know, we, when, when we first went into lockdown, I was in South Sudan doing a job and my wife, she phoned and she was on the sat phone. She was like, this is all unfolding you know like i don't think people are going to travel it sounds like the world's shutting down so sure enough you know three days later we're packing up our camp in south sudan and we're we know we're heading back to ethiopia and you know and and then back to the uk to go into to lockdown um and within a very short space of time i was doing these zooms with you know and podcasts and people were like how do you how should people cope? And, and the one biggest thing, jumping back to how we started this conversation, was routine and discipline. Same for a kid, same for a dog, same for us. Like they, we, we suddenly have all of that taken away from our, our normal lives. That's gone. So, like, be preemptive. Don't deliberate. You know, don't be in this denial phase. It's like, this is happening. Right, let's deal with it anyway. Make a decision. Right, fine. You know, kids are up at this time. Um, it sounds probably a lot easier than it is, but like I exercise from here, you know, I do this from here to here because, you know, without that, you know, it's it's like almost every day is Christmas day, you know, you're in your pajamas, you're sat watching TV and, you know, it, it just gets, it just gets to the point where, you know, you need to be the one that takes control of your, your life at that point, you know, yeah. while everything else is falling apart in every other way, you still can control that, give yourself the routine and, and have the discipline to to follow that through. And that was the biggest thing, you know, the fear of the unknown and how long we'd be in this situation. Um, and I always just feel like it's better to take action than be um, reactive, um, mm. you know, be proactive in that situation. It's like, well, right, fine. It may be here for a week, five days, or a month, or a year, um, and and then sort of write out your. I, I I wrote out a routine. I would write out, you know, I'll be training here, and I'll be doing this here, I'll be doing that there um yeah yeah I, I didn't think i was going to have anything that i i could say that i do uh like aldo kane but yeah the, the routine <laughs> definitely I, i'm a big sticker for my routine so as my partner will tell uh will, will tell everyone i i wake up pretty early at like 5 uh 5 15 every day i have like uh meditation and, and gratitude journals and i exercise every morning and the, the, the thought of me having completed a whole bunch of tasks, including work before most people have got up is great. And it means that by midday, I've completed most of the things that I need to do. And then I can actually kick my feet up and take the, the dog out yeah. for a walk and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I, I love it when I'm working from home that I've got that, that routine uh, nailed. So, and I didn't think I was gonna <laughs> have something that we, we share a common bond over. So that's great. Yeah. Do you, rem do you remember the the uh the moment that you left that bunker like what what was that like when when you you went out and you saw like you know grass and trees and people and it, it was it was one of the most uh, like amazing sort of experiences that that i've had because in lots of ways from a from a what i was seeing feeling and smelling at that time but also from knowing that i'm in this environment the whole time um I, I i'm lucky in a way that with my job you know i get that you know when you go into a cave system for example for five six days in you know venezuela when you start coming so you're in the dark the whole time but you're doing stuff you know you're exploring and when you come back out you start to smell like the rotten vegetation you get that in caves i was in a cave last week in um in, near bristol and uh when you come out you can smell the rotten vegetation you know you eat all the stuff that we're fairly used to smelling here but when i got out of the bunker i like because i'd been in lots of caves i knew that you know i would i would see it, all my senses would would come alive so i was i was like geeing myself up to remember it and i can just honestly it's like the matrix you know because it was a damp cell effectively that i was in in the, the dark and i just came out and it was almost like you could you know, you could smell these, you know, I could smell individual plants and trees. It was in Devon, so it was beautiful. And it was in the middle of summer. Um, the wind, the warm wind on my face, just 
Wow. The, everything being in like glorious Technicolor. Yeah. Um, you know, like as if someone had got it on Snapseed and turned the saturation up. Um, <laughs> and and you know, for the for the the short amount of time, I only had about an hour and twenty minutes to finish off the interview. Um, do a bit of science sort of monitoring, and then I was I was on the train and taxi heading back to London to go to um, Greenland that night. Um, but that bit of time was like utterly amazing. But it's mm. also in a strange way looking back, even just because of this conversation, we can have that every day. Yeah, you know, you can go and go to a local forest or the park, and then just be close your eyes for five seconds and open them and be like, wow. Yeah. Um, which yeah enlightened maybe it, it, isn't it incredible that we forget just how amazing just every second every moment is and it takes that bunker experience to bring that to full life but you can practice that every single day by just reminding yourself just how incredible each yeah. moment is yeah in you know lockdown proved that where people started to notice yeah. the nature and the garden people slowed down you know the the dawn chorus the evening chorus no planes flying above um you know but we can't you can exactly like you say you can go and find these things to do and and it, this goes back to the very start of our conversation is that if that was a thing that made you feel better when it when it happened and you started to notice it then make a point like you now know that that's something that you want to do you found that thing that one of the things that you want to do so make a point of once a week once a month whatever that time scale is to go and leave your normal place and go and see. the big one is to go and see the sunrise like i you know like it's so basic you know but can you imagine being eventually getting your head around thousands of years ago that it might not come back up again you know yeah. and that was it was going to be dark forever yeah. and then it comes up like it's such a free basic thing that 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 I try and do it maybe once a month, maybe once every two or three weeks is to get all the way through, you know, it's easy through the winter, but through the summer as well. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, that's it's amazing. Yeah. That's a, that's an amazing uh, tip for people to, uh, to sort of reconnect. Um, I mean, what, what other, I want to bring our conversation to a, to a nice close here, but uh, what, what, what other activities do you recommend people uh, engage in? Uh, you know, if, if they're listening to this and they work in an office or they work in, um, you know, at home or, or they work in, in hospitals, you know, everyone has their sort of routines in terms of work, but how do we, how do we reconnect and actually, uh, grasp that appreciation for nature and just how lucky we are? I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think in the military, they use the term adventurous training because it, you know, going and doing a, a climb or something, hard and arduous is um analogous to to being at war right so you can see the traits in someone by putting them under pressure on a climb or kayaking or something so and when you look at social media it can be quite worrying and scary that there's so much elitism out there in the outdoors and you know which is off-putting to most people but the simple part of it is is that you anyone can do it you generally don't need a lot of money to do it um but it's much more about again making the decision to do it because you could get up early one morning leave your house and just go for a walk where before all the noise starts and the hubbub of town wakes up um or do it through the night if it's safe to do it somewhere or just get on the train um and and go somewhere that you've never been before and all of these things going somewhere you've never been before, seeing things that you've never seen before can all happen within probably an hour of your house. Yeah. Um, you know, we get set up in all these um, like rat runs of the things that we do in the routine of getting to work and, you know, get off the tube two stops early, get on, you know, walk two stops to the next tube that you wouldn't normally get. I used to do that in Tooting was I would walk, you know, the Northern line. And some yeah. days, you know, if I didn't have, if I didn't have, to you know any more meetings in the afternoon i would walk back along the northern line you know back to where where i lived and i would see places that i would never have normally seen um so i i think again it's that awareness it's really easy to do that's what i 
sussed coming out of the bunker that for my mental health and to have a good cornerstone and foundation it was weird because the things that made the most difference to me were free you mm-hmm. know all the other trappings that i had and the things i wanted and the nice to haves didn't actually make me happy what made me happy was interacting with people exercising and being outside and and actually whether whether you i i i, I won't probably go out on a limb here but i you know I venture to suggest that even if you don't like being outside or exercising or interacting with people, if you did it, you would probably be in a better headspace than you than you were yeah. where, be, where before it. I don't know, um, but yeah, that's. I would say just you know is is get out, get outside, get outside. Yeah. yeah, I I to to go back on a point that you were talking about earlier about how we've evolved. I I certainly think we are um, tribal people that have evolved to live in communities with connection we share food we share stories we you know walk together our mental uh um, meditation practices walking and stillness and and being um cognizant of of everything that's going on in the environment the the two things that i uh am planning well one i'm planning to do one i do fairly often uh the thing i'm planning to do is doing a foraging course uh, because i i I love cooking obviously that's that's my gig like writing cookbooks and stuff but i don't think i know that much about uh growing and and finding stuff in nature and that would be an excuse to go out in the wild as well and the second thing i do for anyone that's living in cities is i found the best time to get that quiet is sunday morning so instead of doing something late on a saturday night or like going out or whatever go to bed early wake up early on sunday honestly it's like there is no one else in the city and walk around go to some of the sites it's incredible it is absolutely amazing so definitely try and do that because you'll be you'll be amazed at how still the city can be yeah that's yeah that's super true and 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 that's not walking back from your saturday night no no <laughs> but um yeah no the and the foraging course as well that's that's something that's you know once once you start to look around and see what's available for eating just you know in in your local park or in your local forest it's 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 quite it has that more gives you that confidence again um yeah you know absolutely. basics food water shelter yeah Aldo, I haven't asked you about lions, narcos, uh, upsetting down volcanoes, anything like that. But hopefully you found this conversation enriching anyway. <laughs> we talked about butterflies and grass and smelling decomposing vegetation. So uh, Yeah, no, I've 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 loved it. It's it's quite um it's quite refreshing because you do I do end up, you know, talking to lots of people about all the adventurous parts mm. of it, but you know, that's that's one part of that that's what I do, but you know, there's, there's a whole other side of what I'm interested in and it's much more about mental well-being about physical health and um yeah I, you know that's everything that we've talked about there has been bang on thank you yeah definitely no no thank you and I think you know my sort of role I guess as a doctor who likes playing around with vegetables and talking about like mindfulness is to sort of extract the rich experiences that you've had for an audience that probably will never get i mean i personally will never get to do some of the amazing things that you've done uh purely because i don't think i've got it in me but also because i don't i i just won't ever get to that point where i'm upsetting down you know and looking at lava rivers and stuff i'm more than happy to watch you do it on tv and feel inspired (laughs) but you know i think there are things that you've done from your experiences that can enrich the lives of people listening to this and um honestly the book's fantastic uh, it's full of wonderful stories and uh yeah i wish you the best with it it's uh, it's amazing what, what are you going to do next actually what, where's the next expedition i, I, I um, i'm sure you've got you've got to like run after this and grab a train and go to heathrow or something. Um, I don't know. um no no i'm uh, i'm <laughs> here i just just got back from the arctic so i've been home for about a month um and i'm not away again until january so oh, cool. uh he- heading over to the states and then down to ecuador so i've got a huge amount of time at home amazing um, which is great being done you you get to see uh, atlas grow Uh, yeah that's amazing